Hi, everyone. Good morning. I think it's still technically morning. We're going to act like it is. So I hope everyone is having a good day so far. Um, my clicker will work. Maybe. Hmm? There we go. Hey. <laughs> Thank you. So thanks for joining us today. Uh, we are here to talk about gardening, foraging, and living off the land with our wonderful guest today for SPX 2024. So thanks for joining us. Uh, I thought first we'd start out just by introducing our panelists, hearing a little bit about their work, and then we will start to get into some plant questions. So let's start out. Oh, this is very uh, enthusiastic clicker. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, Yasmin, uh, can you tell us a little bit about your work and, yeah. Hi, I'm Yasmin Obedifar. My pronouns are she, her. I'm from the Bay Area. Um, I've been making comics for a while. I really love them. I work a lot with nature. I feel like it's like an endlessly inspiring medium. So when I run out of ideas, I'm going to be really scared. <laughs> um, <laughs> But uh, I just finished a book called When to Pick a Pomegranate out with Silver Sprocket. That's my latest book. Awesome. Thank you. Sarah? Hi. Uh, I'm Sarah Beacon. I live in Chicago. Um, I've been making comics for a really long time. Lately, I've been working on a lot of comic book cookbooks, uh, a lot of food-related comics and food illustration. And my latest book is Let's Make Bread, which was co-authored with Ken Forkish. Awesome. Thank you. Iona? Um, I'm Iona Fox. I um, worked in agriculture for 15 years, and I did a um, comic strip in our local alt weekly called Almanac for three and a half years. And um, when I was 33, I actually moved to Chicago, so I no longer do this, but um, I just had a little skin cancer that the doctor told me, okay, maybe find a new career. So, um, and everything's fine, and I'm in good health, but. So this is kind of a different chapter of my life. Thank you for joining us. And Izzy. Oh, thanks. Um, hi, I'm Isabel Rotman. I'm from and currently live in Maine, but there was a period of time where I lived in Chicago for like 11 years. Mm -hmm. And um, my comics kind of run the gamut from like informational activism, sex ed comics to like weird, woodsy, dreamy comics about my feelings. Um, like Yasmin said, I find nature like eternally inspiring. Um, I have only one comic that's like directly about foraging and it's <laughs> this little tiny guy. But um, since I've moved to Maine and always in my heart, um, foraging and gardening have been a big part of my personal life. Amazing, thank you. And so hearing everyone talk, it really brings to mind the fact that working with the land takes so many different forms. Um, folks talking about gardening, folks talking about foraging, the agriculture sense of it too. So I'd love to know a little more about what what kind of work you have done. Like when you think about working with the land, like how does that tie into what you feel connected with? Whoever feels comfortable <laughs> starting, yeah. No, no, that's okay. Um, so me personally uh, have lived in the city limits of Chicago for a really long time and not ever owned a place that had a yard, but I was always into container gardening. Um, and then during the pandemic, got involved with my neighborhood community garden and started working there, helping out, like coordinating the volunteers and liked it so much that uh, I ended up taking the Illinois Master Gardening course uh, oh. from, from the extension. I did not go through with the volunteer hours to actually get the certification, but I just wanted the knowledge, so I'm like a secret master gardener now. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> but so yeah, so I mean, uh, my connection to it is very much limited to uh, a very urban environment, but there's still lots of like foraging and like uh, growing food off of the land that you can do even in an environment like that. Amazing. Uh, Yasmin, how about you? Yeah, I, I like this question because I think about it a lot. Um, I, I grew up in America, but I would, I'm from, my parents are from Iran, and I would go and visit my family. And my grandfather had a really large appreciation for the land, and he had like a small garden. Like in Iran, you can have like a little plot of land where you can grow like fruits and vegetables. And he would show me all these different sorts of things like 
there's mulberries and you can use the leaves of mulberries to like wash your hands or like mm. you can eat um, like almonds before they're ripe. Just things like that that felt really visceral and part of like my appreciation for the land. So like I went into making art about land and then my <laughs> sister is like an environmental lawyer. So like we both really care for the environment. But also during COVID I had like time to sort of like grow things, put things in like like I had a sweet potato that I put in water and then I like watched it grow, like things like that that I started to like really get into. But um, it's definitely from like my heritage. I feel like there's a lot of appreciation for the land and nature and fruits. Incredible, thank you. And I, uh, Iona, you were telling me a little bit about your agriculture work that you have done. Can you tell us more about that? Sure. Um, I ran a farm um, with my former partner in Burlington, Vermont, for a long while, and then I was part of a cooperatively owned farm um, for a little bit. And um, since I no longer farm, like I've sort of been able to like get interested in it again, like in a, from a zoomed out perspective. Like I think when I was doing it, it was very like X Y Z, like we all need paychecks, <laughs> like mm -hmm. we're holding it together. Um, but now when I was thinking about this panel, I was thinking like, now it seems really interesting to me to like zoom out and be like, wow, it's like this 12,000 year old human practice that in its like yes. late capitalist form. Like it's just a weird, <laughs> there's just a lot um, that now seems like intellectually interesting to me um, now that I live in a city. I do have a yard, um, but I try to only grow like impractical things. Mm -hmm. Like I'm never growing a carrot again. <laughs> Yeah, I think at one point you had mentioned something that was like when people think of farming, they think of food, but it's really about the plants. And right. Yeah. That yeah, I really don't know anything about food. Um, like it, it kind of, to me, was always about plants, like the needs of plants. Um, and then we would kind of pack it on a truck and drive it up the hill to hand off to somebody else. And then in my mind, it became food in mm. their hands. How about you? I think about it like food. <laughs> I'm like, my hobbies involve what can I eat. Um, someone's like, you want to go bird watching? And I'm like, do we eat them? Um, <laughs> no, I, because I, I, I started teaching myself to forage um, through books when I was in high school. And I'm, I always hear about foraging as like a cultural pass down, like what Yasmin was saying. And I had that with gardening, but with foraging, I, I just had books. And I was like 17 learning from books and my parents were terrified that I'd die. Mm -hmm. um, so it was a little different. And, I'm, and, I, and I like your story, that sounds really nice. <laughs> um, and then I moved to Chicago and I didn't want to forage in Chicago because of um, pollution. So I just kind of forage like non-edible things. Mm -hmm. um, and when I moved back to Maine, like part of the big reason for it was I was like, I, I'm tired of taking trips into nature. Like I want to live in it. I want to like see a blackberry bush flowering and be like, I'll see you in a month <laughs> and come to the same bush in a month and like having that like connection with the same area over a whole calendar year felt so attractive to me mm -hmm. and um, is it okay if I ask the panel a question? Yeah. Okay. I've been trying to think about this to prepare for the panel. There's something to me so special about eating something that you either found or grew and I, it makes me so happy and I cannot put into words why. <laughs> and I was wondering if you guys had any thoughts or felt the same way. Yeah, definitely feel the same way. Uh, <laughs> last summer, uh, I had tomatoes and eggplant and, uh, and summer squash growing in my tiny little like four by 10 community garden plot. And my partner made a big thing of ratatouille. And like, I think the only thing in this that wasn't grown from seed by me was the onions, because onions yeah. are like, they're biannual on it. Like I don't have the patience to wait two years for that. <laughs> um, but, uh, but yeah, just having that pot in front of me and knowing that like everything that w went in it, like my hands touched it when it was this tiny, when it was just a seed and all of that genetic information was in that seed. And then- I feel like, like I'm gonna cry. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, and then like, yeah, being able to like grow and cultivate those plants and collect the fruit and have them all go into like one dish. Yeah, there's something really profound and, po and like poetic about that. Yeah, I don't know yeah. if I could like 
put my finger on like the exact words of why, but yeah, it's beautiful. Yeah, yeah. I feel like, so also during the pandemic, I got into foraging and I just love identifying plants. Yes. Um, but I think the joy for me is like just the knowing. Like I love, yeah. like if you go on a walk with me, I'm like, look at that, that's that, look at that. <laughs> I'm like, eat this. And people are like, I don't know. I don't want to eat that. Um, I think it's just the joy. It, it feels very human. You know, I think we we go to the grocery store. We get a little plastic thing of grapes, you know. But it's like, if I point to a grape like tree, I'm like, you can eat that. People are like, I don't know. You know, and it's like, I think the joy is the reconnection. I think I saw once, like, someone was like, I didn't know that fruit grew on trees. You know, like, we're so disconnected from where things come from. So I think it's the joy in like reconnecting with what feels the most natural. Yeah, I felt something when you said it's very human yeah. also. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And I guess too, like, I think you, at that point you've had a long relationship with this thing you're about to eat. Yeah. Like you've taken care of it. And I think there is like, people say like, if you take care of something, you grow to, like that's how you grow to love something, oh. which is like maybe a little overblown for like your <laughs> tomato sandwich, but at the same time, you, you even noticed it at all. Like, I, yeah, well, that, yeah. absolutely. I mean, like in Chicago, if you want to grow something like tomatoes or peppers, you have to start them indoors, you know, mm -hmm. or buy seedlings that are already started because this, the growing season's so short. So like not only, you know, did my hands touch that tomato seed, but I grew them indoors, like on a seedling heat map, under lamps, you know, yeah. rotating them, trying to make sure that they had just enough water for several weeks until it was safe to like harden them off and put them outside for a couple of hours every day until it was safe to actually put them in the ground. And like, so yeah, yeah, you've got like months long relationship with this, yeah. with this plant. And maybe with foraging, because with foraging, you don't nurture it. You just find it. Yeah. Um, maybe then the like the, the long term connection is with the place. Mm -hmm that you found it. Yeah. Thank you for helping me sort through this. <laughs> no, this is incredible. Publicly. I, I welcome <laughs> any internal questions that may arise. I'm, I'm very into that. Um, amazing. So uh, I wanted to talk a little bit about these two really big things, comics and this working with the land that we live on and what influence those had on one another. Um, I feel mm -hmm. like some folks set out specifically to write about this and other folks sort of wander backwards. I feel like every cartoonist I know got into gardening in the last like three years. <laughs> um, and so I'd love to know more about how those things work together for you. I, I think about comics a lot as time. Like I think comics is a medium in which that you can capture time in varieties of ways. Like you can slow down time, you can extend time. Like we have comics where they're, we see every single moment in someone processing something really huge, which we don't really see in other mediums in a visual way. And so I think about plants and gardening and all of these things in nature as like time and like a cycle and things just go in a circle. Like everything in nature does this like forever, mm -hmm. right? And I think a lot about how comics is this vessel of time and nature is also a vessel of time. And so I feel like they have that connection of telling how, I don't know, like it's both very human things. Like I think, um, I don't know, like I, I do keep saying this thing of human, but I do think comic making and visual, in the visual way that we do it, it's like images that tell a story is like one of the oldest ways that we depicted ourselves. So I feel like it's that connection to something that's deep in us mm. is kind of what I feel like I put together with that. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think I think my re my relationship to nature and plants affects my comics, but I'm not sure it goes the other way around. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I have a series called Burn Your Demons that I use to kind of just like sort through sort through my problems and um, it's all very dreamy and metaphor and half of it's autobio and half of it takes place in this metaphorical forest that is like the inside of my head. And that forest is so inspired by um, the forest in Maine. Mm -hmm. So there's like many plants in there that are from Maine and many like adaptation, you know, like fantasy adaptations of those plants. And I think it's like, it all kind of comes back comes back to that for me. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. 
You look like you're thinking. Oh, sorry. Yeah, no, no, go ahead. <laughs> I'm sure. Um, I think for me, like, it was about, like, agriculture because I think it can get reduced to kind of like a simple symbol, like a lost time or like this like pure, I mean, this happens to like anything related to nature maybe where it's like more pure and pious and, and healing or it's like scary and like uncaring. And it's just like, that's so like, that's so like zoomed out and abstract. Like I just felt like, um, no, it's like a lived experience every day. It's like, there's all these like individual like species out there living their lives. It's not just like one symbol like symbolic thing to humanity or something. Yeah. Like it's a completely distinct millions of things. Mm -hmm. And that was like, that's like an annoying thing to me. And I really wanted to write like something that felt real mm -hmm. and specific. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think you're right because it does sort of get reduced to these, you know, 15 second TikTok length videos of here was my seed and now here is this wonderful thing. And it mm -hmm. does not give you the months and months and months of worrying over it in the dirt on your hands and, and all of those things. So yeah, that's a that's a really excellent point. Um, I think it's hard to care about something that's just like an abstraction. Like, mm -hmm. yeah, what, you know. Yeah. yeah. I mean, to that end, what you were saying, like, I feel like comics is so, like it's such, making them is such a tedious and long process and requires so much patience. And gardening definitely requires that that element of patience and it takes that many months to you know to put something in the ground and have it actually produce for you and foraging takes that kind of patience because you have to like learn what you're seeing and learn how to distinguish one plant from the next one and like and wait for them to come into season exactly exactly yeah exactly and like and yeah and develop relationships with places so that you know oh next September I can come back and like the, these pawpaws will be ready, or you know, oh, pawpaws. Oh, <laughs> don't don't flirt not, with me. Not to <laughs> not to derail the cars. I mean, I did actually. I learned I learned how to can last year. Like I feel like all my all my hobbies are old lady hobbies now. But I learned how to can last year specifically to make pawpaw jam, so that I could like stretch that flavor out because those things are ripe for like two weeks. It's insane. I've never had one. I've never had one either. <laughs> yeah, don't, don't sleep on pawpaws. <laughs> Who was it that described themselves as a pawpaw evangelist? It's probably, probably me. <laughs> I was like, tell me more about what this means. Do you guys know what a pawpaw is? Can you tell them? Yeah, okay, all right. So, like, <laughs> you guys, as Americans, everyone should know this. Like, I'm very patriotic about this. This is America's largest native fruit. And they are, the only reason that we don't know about them is because they are anti-capitalist. Because you can't really make an orchard and like, they, they don't travel very well, so you can't package them and sell them in your grocery store. So you have to find these either on your own as a forager or find somebody who's got a grove and is willing to share with you. But they taste like juicy fruit gum. Like they are, they're this wild mix of like mango and custard and banana and uh, pineapple even. And when you get them super right, they're, they're like really soft and you can just like, you cut it in half, you, the seeds are huge, they're like this big. Um, and you can just eat it right like with a spoon, just like scoop it right out, scoop the flesh right out of the thing. Um, and they're marvelous and I love them. And I think it was a year or two and ago. Where do they grow? They grow, uh, uh, so like uh, the, basically Southern Canada through like uh, the southern United States on the eastern half of the country. So through Appalachia and the Midwest, uh, Ohio's got a lot of them. Uh, Illinois, where I'm in Chicago, is kind of like the northern end of their range, uh, but you can still find groves there. And there are enough enthusiasts out there that they've been doing some crossbreeding and trying to get some that are a little hardier in different regions. But uh, no, they're marvelous. It was, it was like a year or two ago that I was reading an article about them and I was like, gosh, I hope I get to taste a pawpaw someday. And two days later, Liz Kozik, who's another cartoonist who also draws a lot about like food and, and gardening and prairie stuff. She's like, hey, I just got a crate of pawpaws. Do you want some? I was like, now's the time to play the lottery. Like just ask the universe for what you want. <laughs> anyway, pawpaws are great. If you can find them, definitely get some. They're delicious. 
Sorry, sorry to derail the conversation. No, I didn't <laughs> realize that I would suddenly develop like an emotional kinship with a fruit. <laughs> so this is a new experience for me. Thank you very much for that. Um, no, that's that's great. And now I also want Paw Paw Jay. <laughs> like I, I don't know if they can survive in South Philly, but we're about to find out. Um, amazing. Uh, so. One uh, one theme that I noticed when looking at everyone's work was the idea of this work as the with the land as a vehicle for change, and change looks a lot of different ways. You know, it is the literal growth of things, is the literal death of things. Uh, it's also internal change, social change. There's a lot going on there, and so um, I guess I wanted to start out by saying. Was was this intentional? Were you seeking some type of vehicle for this? Did it just kind of happen? Tell me, tell me more about this. Also, am I entirely off base and making things up because I think they sound cool? <laughs> um, I think it helped me a lot processing grief. Um, I lost a really good friend of mine when I was gardening, and it was like this really surreal act for me and. I looked at the plot of, it was like a bunch of succulents that I planted, and then I watched it as it went, as she was gone. And I think the idea of, because I think we think death is like final, like that's it, right? But I think nature allowed me to understand that there is more than just this one end. Like there's change, there's rebirth, there's growth. And I think it just helped me process this idea of like substantial grief and just seeing how nature processes it itself by just keeping itself going. And it, it could be seen as cruel, right? Like we, things, we see things just die and it's gone, but there's an impact, there's like things in the soil. Like even if like a plant dies, like there's all this like mycelium that's going to eat it and like it keeps going and then we have soil and then we make something else. So mm. yeah, I think, I think it really helped like, like change, I guess, but also I think mostly like it really Grief is what was my big thing with yeah. it. Yeah. Yeah. That's beautiful. Uh, Iona, you have had some some really interesting work regarding social change in agri in agriculture. And unfortunately my um, little clicker is not uh, going forward the way that I wanted it to, but this specifically was the piece that I was thinking about um, that discusses migrant workers. Um, so when I was doing the comic strip, I just to, you know, I would get tired of my own brain. And so I started doing interviews with like various like people in the farming community. And um, I did this with, um, there's an organization called Migrant Justice in Vermont, um, which is undocumented farm workers have, have organized and um, sort of outlined like a, a milk with, dignity like certification for farms and they've also like won the right to license and just had a lot of like um, successes that way. And so I, I um, have volunteered with them in the past and um, we ran this four part interview in the newspaper. Um, it was like right around the 2016 election. So there was a lot of like, um, I mean, people were just like all of a sudden getting round, rounded up really quickly and so I thought, well, we have this like small town newspaper, you know, I, I just felt like I want to do s something. Um, and so that's what this interview was. Thank you. Yeah, that was, that was really fascinating to me. And I, I think being someone who is not as closely connected to that aspect of my life, you know, I go to the grocery store, I am not as aware as I should be or want to be about all the things that get us to where we are at the stage of convenience that we, we currently have. So yeah, this was really interesting to me. Um, I also learned a lot of things about cooking from you, Sarah. <laughs> uh, and cooking is its own kind of change, right? It's a yeah. physical and chemical change. And so I'd love to know more about, uh, more about that with your work. <laughs> well, I think that that is, like you were saying earlier, I did kind of uh, come backwards into you know, gardening and, and uh, botany and plant stuff from the food world for, you know, for trying to rediscover sort of those connections to like, where does our food come from, you know? Um, and yeah, uh, definitely like, I'm 
trying to think of what I wanted to say here. Like, I know that, um, I, like, came to the community garden during the pandemic, like during the lockdown stage of the pandemic when I couldn't travel, I couldn't see my friends, and I felt like a lot of us are, um, you know, our focus kind of turned a lot more local, a lot more, you know, micro local to what we were working with, you know, what the things that we were allowed to go and do and see. And, um, you know, in working in this community garden, suddenly realized that like this place that I walked past and occasionally sat in, like if you go there every day, you see how quickly it changes, how much everything changes. The, the things that you're growing for food, but also just like the prairie plants that are in there, you know, one week they'll be blooming and the next week they're over and the next week they're going to seed and like just watching that transformation happen over time. Uh, it was really fascinating to me, you know, and so it just became like I can't see my human friends, but now I have plant friends, you know. <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, like the, I mean, the whole stage of like growing something or finding something, you know, and, and taking it indoors and cleaning it and taking off the parts that you can't eat and like turning them into something that you can eat, that sort of transformation is, is really fascinating to me. Um, you know, and I, I do think uh, kind of like what Yasmin was saying about grieving, like I think the longer that you work with plants uh, and, and the more time that you spend with them, the more comfortable you get with the idea of death. Like it's everywhere, you know, and, and you do see that cycle and that it's necessary, you know, uh, in order for things, you know, things have to die in order for like new things to be born from them or, you know, uh, especially with prairie plants, there are so many of them that like, they have to experience like a really tough winter in order to grow the next year or plants in the West that have to experience fire in order to grow the next year. Like those kinds of changes and transformations are really fascinating. Yeah, thank you. Um, and let me, see. there we go. Okay, uh, mm -hmm. this is from your comic Antlers. Right, Isabella? Yeah, this is a short comic that I never printed that I made to communicate that I was moving from Chicago to Maine permanently. Um, I had I had temporarily moved um, and was staying with my parents in like peak 2020 COVID just to like have a better chance of living through it. Um, and then I was like, oh, I, I like it. <laughs> I think I'm gonna come back and get my stuff and not renew my lease. So I, I made this comic to tell everyone because that's how we tell people things, I guess. <laughs> um, and yeah, I do love this little section where um, my boyfriend and I had just started dating and he told me I had antlers in my heart. And I was like, ah, oh, I guess I should move to Maine. <laughs> but um, yeah, I, I was. your question was about cycles, right? I think, um, I think it's helped me have a better relationship with seasons because Maine has seasons and I, um, I find myself getting depressed in winter because I don't get enough sunlight on my skin. I get no sunlight on my skin. Um, and I've, now that I'm gardening and foraging, I think, it, I think it's helping me see winter not as just like a time when everything dies but a time when my most physically demanding hobbies are on break <laughs> and I can rest and I can plan my next garden in my notebook and I can think about my last garden and how I'd improve it and I can think about the plants that like need winter to like rest and come back and I can do maple syrup <laughs> and, and try to learn to cross country ski, which I'm very bad at. Um, so, so yeah, back to what Yasmin said about cycles and everything in nature is cycles and um, getting to see this thing that used to in the city just mean it's, it's depression three months t as, as part of a cycle that I, that I love. Yeah. Thank you. So at this point, I think we have time to open things up for a few questions. Um, we do have two microphones, one on either side, that folks are welcome to use if they would like. Um, if you would like the microphone and are not available to go up there, if you could just raise our hand and we'll bring it, uh, we'll bring it over for you. Um, but yeah, all of this is just so fascinating to me. And it now also immediately makes me want to like run out to the woods uh, <laughs> and so this is this is one thing i was bringing I, I was thinking of while we were doing this was uh there is a big problem with ai foraging manuals oh now, yeah uh that is very it's very bad. dangerous yeah. um and we're starting to hear these terrible stories about 
AI not representing things and this being a really big safety concern. And so it was like, people are going to die. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. People have died. And I'm like, aha, an opportunity for my cartoonist friends. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, it's, that's a, an interesting and horrifying turn of events. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm kind of terrified of mushroom foraging anyway. Like, even with a stack of textbooks, you know, mm -hmm. from reliable sources, I think I'd still be kind of afraid. Like, there's so many mushrooms that are delicious and so many that will immediately kill you, and a lot Let, of them look very similar. Let's talk. Yeah. <laughs> let's talk, because that is, that is true. But there are also mushrooms that I call beginner mushrooms that oh. do not have poisonous lookalikes. So if you kind of just like limit to yourself to like those six mushrooms and like look around for them while practicing your identification on mushrooms you don't eat, you just like identify and move on. I think it can be a very safe thing to learn. Okay, let's talk. Yeah. Yeah, let's talk. <laughs> yeah, that's great to know. I feel like I need um, a foraging chaperone. Just because I would become so anxiety prone about getting it incorrect and be like, I need to have a little buddy check my work to make sure that I'm not. You know, I love that idea. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I, need a, I need a chaperone. Um, also, that I made the mistake once of asking a foraging friend, like, oh, do they have morels around here? And the look on their face was just like a door slammed. And they're like, I'm not going to tell you. <laughs> I did not realize this was such a tempestuous. A uh, discussion to have with someone. It was like, all right, I'm sorry, I'm not going to ask <laughs> you about They wouldn't them. even tell you if morels were regionally in the area. And they, I think, their like panic response kicked up, and they were <laughs> like, uh, uh, they're like, they exist around here. Like, okay, fine. <laughs> I won't ask any more questions about that. I, w I was once a shop. I was on a trail. So I, I'm from California, and there's a California buckeye. It's like a tree and. Uh, when it's like, I guess, a fruit, it has a thing that looks like a huge chestnut, and it's really toxic, like you will die. <laughs> and I was like walking on the trail, and then there's this guy with like this many, <laughs> like this, and I was like, hmm, like. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, uh, like those will kill you, you know? And he was like, whoa, and he like dropped them. <laughs> upset the Buckeye, I'm sorry. Um, but yeah, if you're ever in California and you see a chestnut, don't eat it. It's not a chestnut. We have a couple of questions, so let's start over here and then we'll come over here, if that's okay. Sure. Uh, hey, so easy one and then I'll let, I'll let another question go and I've got a second one. So the first one is, what's like your favorite gardening or foraging tool? Like what have you found that's been really useful that we might not be thinking about? Okay, I'm going to step in here real quick and say that this year I got a hori hori knife, which is like a traditional Japanese gardening tool, and it's got like one serrated edge. I mean, it's just like a big knife, and I love having a giant knife in the garden. <laughs> but it's also, it's like, it's great for weeding. Like, you can dive straight in and like, you know, you usually get the, the weed out by the root, and you can cut things with like the sharper side, and like, so there's lots of uses for it, but also it's just a really cool looking big knife. <laughs> I'm just gonna plug Yul, Yul Gibbons. So Yul Gibbons is an author, um, a, not a current author, who wrote Stalking the Wild Asparagus and Stalking the Blue-Eyed Scallop, and it's really, really great foraging knowledge that, that is not modern, which I like, so I, I would recommend reading um, his books, and then also just Audubon Field Guide to North American Mushrooms. So really not niche in any way, but that's the stuff. Did you spell that first? Yule, I, uh, I think it's E-U-L-L, -L. Gibbons, yeah. Uh, I use my hands a lot, which is bad. <laughs> <laughs> I remember once, so I used to work at Silver Sprocket, which is in the Mission in San Francisco, and I would take the same walk every, you know, whatever. But there was this one plant, and I'm totally blanking on the name, but it's a California native, it's beautiful, and I was like, oh, I want to propagate it. And I tried to grab it, it has a bunch of little spikes on it, and I was like, Oh my god. And then I had, <laughs> and then I just picked them off at Bart like for like anyways, don't use your hands. Don't do that. Um now that I have a garden, the thing I use most is this like uh 
woven basket that's like tight enough that nothing falls through, but it feels like it's always clean somehow, no matter mm. what I put in it. Like you can kind of flip it over and like psh, 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 <laughs> totally clean. If you have like something that's kind of wet, it just seems to like, I don't know, evaporate. Yeah, it's very low maintenance. I love it. Magic basket. Uh, so we had, a, yeah, there you are. Hi. So what kind of resources do you like to use to learn more about what's edible in your area? Like online, books, classes, what do you like to use? Um, I mean, for me personally, the uh, when you do the master gardening program, they usually leave, you have the manual that in perpetuity, and it's been like an invaluable resource. If you get the electronic version, you can usually you can hunt through it and like look for whatever it is that you're looking for. Um, those classes, I, I think every state has a master gardening program. It's not usually expensive. I think mine like was a semester, and it was like three hundred dollars. Um, but like beyond that, uh, for foraging, like I don't know if it's still being updated, but I use fallingfruit.org a lot. That's great for like just finding whatever weird plants have been reported in your area that it, might. It's like a map, right? Yeah, 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 interactive map. Yeah, so you can add things to it too. Um, yeah, those are like I mean, now that I have the master gardening manual, like that's the big one that I use. I already plugged Yule Gibbons. I'm a book guy, I think, but now that I know about the master gardening program, I want to do that. <laughs> um, I'm from the Bay, so I'm going to plug an app, I guess. Uh, <laughs> uh, there's iNaturalist. It's great. There's Picture This. I yeah. use that. Um, but iNaturalist is cool because they say where they got the thing, so you're like, oh, I can get the same thing there. So yeah. you can see where people are sneakily getting things. Um, but there's also like naturalists and uh, people that are like, like, I follow this really cool guy in the Bay called Damon Tai, and he'll just talk about what's in the area and do workshops. So like there might just people that are like really into this stuff and do workshops. He taught me about moths and mushrooms sometime. It was, it was cool. So there's people, there's weirdos everywhere. I use the Seek app too, which I think is from iNaturalist. Mm -hmm. But yeah, the apps are great too. I like when I'm doing like plant ID. I feel like if you get like two or three of them, then you can cross reference and be pretty sure. You know, even though you are relying on a computer to tell you if something's edible or not poisonous. I'll back iNaturalist. I really love to use the function where you can just like look at where you are and see the list of what people have reported. Like even if you're not seeking anything, like I find I do this a lot in the winter when I've been mm -hmm. inside for two weeks straight, I'll just like, just see what people have like geotagged in my area and That's just cool. makes me feel connected to, I don't know, even the possibility that like things are out there to notice. Now I feel like I need to download all of these apps <laughs> and see, see what I can find. Uh, yes, so we have the second part of our question, I believe, over on this side. Yeah? Oh, okay. hi. I mean, if you... Okay, hello. Yeah. Um, I feel like a big part of how I've built knowledge about these things is heavily dependent on mentorship and especially intergenerational mentorship. Mm -hmm. And I think not everyone lives in a place physically where that's even possible. Several of you have talked about being in urban areas. And I was curious on your reflections of that in your own lives and what duty you have as someone who knows about that and makes work about it to sort of how, how you engage with it in thinking about stewardship and passing on the same information. Thanks. Mm -hmm. I think because I live in the diaspora, like I do have knowledge of Iran, right? Like there's all these plants and information because of my grandfather. Like I know about like Somov, I know about like all of these things in their life cycle, but they don't, you know, it's not relevant to here. But I think it's important that I keep and possess that knowledge and think about it. And I think I make a lot of work in relation to my culture and like where these these certain plants have meaning and like sort of larger like poetic or like sort of meanings that you can ascribe. Um, but I also do think about like being in America and like being in like an occupied land and like how disconnected we are from that land. Um, so it's, it's a lot to think about, but there's a lot of really great, um, like I think it's, you mentioned like mentorships, like there's really good people that are doing these sorts of reconnections with the land 
again, like I know from where I'm at, like there's um, UC Berkeley used to have a piece of land that was going to be for GMO farming, and a bunch of students occupied the land. I think a while back ago, but they still grow a bunch of plants there. Um, I think it's like part of like the Ohlone, like they've repatriated the land, like, mm. um, and also like I actually have a friend who grows uh, specifically Iranian uh, seeds and is sort of bringing diaspora seeds into uh, Petaluma and growing certain herbs and plants that we can't get here that easily. So there's really like, I think it's like ways in which we can like work with the land that we have. And I think there's a lot of really cool people that are doing this kind of work that need to be appreciated way more. I'm, I mean, I'm, I just know them and I think they're cool, but uh, I guess again, my connection is just like what I know, but it's something I consistently think about being in the diaspora. Yeah, I didn't. Um, I don't have anyone like in my family who is into gardening, you know. So I, I don't have like that intergenerational mentorship. But coming into this community garden, the guy who uh, is in charge of it, uh, he comes from a long line of that. So he's been a great mentor. And the woman who used to be in charge of the community garden still lives right next door. So she's been a great mentor. And like. Uh, Chicago has a whole network of all the different neighborhood community gardens that have an association and they have like meetings and like uh, classes and workshops will open somebody in to lecture about like early spring planting and stuff. Uh, so like even if you don't have that, you know, in your family, uh, if you don't have that history, there are places to find it, places to find mentors all around. Like, yeah. Yeah. Um, I still feel pretty new to the Midwest and getting familiar with that landscape. Um, and I use the Chicago Parks resources a lot. They have a ton of programming and volunteer stuff. Um, it's really rich. That's really great. Thank you. All right, so I'm curious on your experiences and thoughts on composting. <laughs> I'm sorry, on what? Could you repeat that? On composting? Yeah. Composting. Yeah. composting. Oh, okay, we're getting into the, the serious stuff. Yes, please tell me about composting. It's good. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, um, I, so the way I learned to compost is that you just like make a big pile of rotting food in your yard and you wait. Um, <laughs> and that feels to me as complicated as it has to be. Um, I know that when people live in cities, it, you have to like cover it because of rats. Mm -hmm. um, but, but where I live, you just make the pile. Um, and I have a friend who, who has not been composting, and I asked her why not, and she was like, it's complicated, and people have classes about how to do it, and like you need worms. And I'm like, girl, the worms just come out of the ground. <laughs> <laughs> the worms come out of the ground by themselves. That's where they live, and they go into the compost, and then that's where they live. And I, I do feel a little bit about composting that I'm like, I think we should all admit that it can be extremely simple and easy and that we can all just do it unless we have rats and then you have to do it in a container. Um, yeah, that's my take. <laughs> We have a big tumbler in the community garden for compost uh, to lift it up off the ground and keep it secure from all of Chicago's rats. Um, <laughs> and I, I, like one year, we were empty, we were pulling it out and like got a lot of good worms out of it. And I was like, "But it's a tumbler, like it's raised off the ground. Where did these worms come from?" Because I'd been dumping my food scraps in there. I was like, "Did they did come these, from your food? Did they come from? No, they came from the leaves. They like the worms lay eggs in the leaves that go into as the dry parts of the compost." I was like, "I don't know why it took me like away blew my mind that that these worms had like they'd spontaneously generated from the compost that I put in there." Uh, but it is kind of hard to maintain in the community garden too because like everybody dumps their stuff in and they don't put enough like dry materials to like the the wet materials and so I'm the one who's scrambling trying to find like leaves. Extra, yeah. I have the opposite <laughs> like, tearing problem. Tearing up cardboard or like <laughs> I have the opposite problem because I yeah. have so many leaves. <laughs> um I don't know. There's a green bin in San Francisco. You put green stuff in it. It goes somewhere. Yeah. <laughs> it gets composted. <laughs> it's easy. We should do it. Everyone should be doing it. <laughs> I agree with Izzy about um, like trying to keep it simple. I 
because that means I'll actually do something if I don't have to like overthink it. And I do like the green brown method of like some fresh stuff, some more dried out stuff to keep the moisture and texture kind of right. But the thing I've been encountering is um, like I have kind of like finally learned about like Midwestern lawn culture that maybe people don't want just like crappy piles. <laughs> like I share a backyard with all, all the people on the block and so I kind of had to learn that like in more populated areas or like in the mes Midwest, there's like different ideas than I grew up with about like, you know, like keep it looking nice, keep the edges, <laughs> keep the edges nice. Like don't just put these random piles of shit everywhere. <laughs> so I've been working on that. Random piles of rotting stuff, yeah. Yeah, yeah. that's all compost that. is. Yeah, the, um, <laughs> the capitalism associated with uh, composting is very interesting to me. So I recently took a trip to Vermont and stopped at the extremely fancy local grocery store that I was like, I don't actually know that I can afford to like buy anything mm -hmm. here. And they had lobster compost. What? Like the shells and like <gasps> disc... Seafood compost, seafood compost is a big thing. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. And I was like, this is the most expensive dirt I've ever seen in my life. <laughs> but it's also, it also could just be trash from restaurants that's set aside for compost. Yeah, yeah. That was just fascinating to me. I was yeah. like, wow, fancy dirt. <laughs> Wild. <Wow. laughs> Seaweed is actually good compost. Yeah? Yeah. I, this year, I think I'm just going to go to the beach and like, filled some disgusting buckets of seaweed and dumped that <laughs> around. <laughs> yeah, why not? It sounds like a good time. <laughs> so we have a few minutes left. Um, I did want to talk to folks about what you have coming up, what projects have been very exciting for you, and also where we can find you for the rest of the show. So well, I, was, I think there's one more. Oh, we, do we have one oh. more. Oh. Hello. Hi. Hi. So I have a silly question. I live in a place where we do community gardens so there seems to be a fight between what the deer allow and what the people will allow so one of my friends planted a garden in memory of all the children who passed away and that sort of thing so it's really beautiful but she also started doing natural fencing she would take willow i think and bend it and create a living fence Cool. And I was wondering, do you have any stories like that where you have two gardeners pitted against each other or like the fight between the deer and the humans? <laughs> it, um, I, I think the experience of a cute animal eating your garden will very quickly turn you into someone you don't recognize. <laughs> so I'm like, oh, bunnies, I love bunnies. And after like two weeks of bunnies eating all my seedlings, I'm like... Yep. I'm about to kill some yeah. bunnies. <laughs> yeah, I tried to grow a tomato last... I've grown tomatoes before in, in San Jose, but I grew them in Oakland, and I would get like a bunch of green tomatoes, and I was like, yes! And then I would go down, and then they were all gone. <laughs> no. I didn't figure it out. I was like, all right, no tomatoes. It's over. <laughs> uh, so my community garden has been in its spot uh, since the 70s. It's like Chicago Park District land. So like even through all the gentrification, like nobody's been able to buy it or develop it. But so there have been a lot of people involved in this. And uh, the lady who lives next door who used to be in charge of the community garden has many opinions about what we're doing mm -hmm. and is not shy about sharing them. And uh, we'll often offer like, uh, conflicting criticism. So she'll tell Carson one thing that we should be doing and then tell me the opposite thing that we should be doing. She just, she wants to be involved, but she's older now and she can't really do it physically. Uh, so that's, I mean, that besides the rabbit who ate all of my snow peas this winter, like, <laughs> yeah, that's been the, the biggest, the biggest thing is that like Migdalia doesn't want to let go, let go control of the garden, you know, but I understand that. I would feel yeah. the same way. You get emotionally attached. Yeah. I actually, I fenced my garden because of the deer. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Because they can, did you know that to actually keep deer out of your garden, you need a 10 foot fence? Mm -hmm. I don't think anything, jump that high. anything, or maybe it's eight, eight or 10, I can't remember which, but anything under that is simply a deterrent. <laughs> <laughs> Our method that we settled on, um, I don't do this in Chicago, this was in Vermont, but we had a double fence because there was, I guess it's confusing for deer, like with depth depth perception, 
and it looked kind of like this. So mm. like the bottom of the fence kind of crisscrossed and formed like a gap in between the two. And then we would put um, tin foil with a little peanut butter like along the electric fence so that if they, you know, they would know what they were in for. <laughs> and that finally did work, but that's not a solution that most people can make work for them. Oh, I, I, yeah. can I say one other thing yeah. that's cool? I visited, um, I visited a chicken farm to take a chicken class. Um, and I noticed on like their picnic table, there were just like three eggs just sitting on the picnic table. And I'm like, what's up? Someone forget some eggs. And they were like, no, those are for the crows and ravens. And they make <gasps> offerings <laughs> to the crows and ravens. And then the crows and ravens take up residence and crows and ravens will chase hawks. Oh, that's so smart. And reduce the amount of hawks killing chickens. It's like, that's so cool. So cool. It's like offerings to the old gods. Yeah. <laughs> so cool. Absolutely. It feels like an extremely fair trade-off, <laughs> honestly. <laughs> Incredible. Okay, so it does, thank you for that. The light made it so I could not see our friend over here. Um, great. So, yeah, I thought we'd just take a couple minutes to talk about what's coming up, where we can find you. Uh, let's make my way through the clicker. Maybe. Tom, would you mind uh, moving that to the last slide with the contact info, please? Thanks. Thanks. Okay, so I think we went this way before, so maybe let's go backwards this way. Uh, Iona, if you want to tell us what you're up to. Um, I just finished a two and a half year long um, essay that came out this summer, so I'm trying to just have fun, and I'm, and that's at my table. It's called Tough Shit. and. Um, now I'm working on some short fiction stories with a friend that are just like pure fun. Cool, nice, awesome. Um, so uh, Let's Make Bread came out in May of this year, so that's my newest. I am working on a new one about cocktails, uh, but it won't be out until like 2026, so that's gonna be a while. In the meantime, uh, I am trying to work on a mini comic about uh, Czech kolaches, are these little pastries that my grandmother used to make that I finally like mastered the recipe myself, and so, Eventually, that'll just be like a little 40 pager that I have out with a recipe so that everyone can have kolaches. <laughs> Where can we find you? Oh, sorry. Um, I'm H3. I'm C10. Um, my latest book is When to Pick a Pomegranate. It's out the 25th, but you can get it here. It's debuting. Um, I'll be on a tour on the West Coast, but if you're from the West Coast, I'll be in a few cities. Um, I'm at the Silver Sprocket table, and it's there. I'm at table J5. Um, I have a couple new zines this year. Um, debuting is a zine I worked on with Marnie Galloway and Sage Coffee from Silver Sprocket called Abortion Pill Zine, and it's like a how-to, how to find, how to support um, about Mifepristone and misoprostol. And then I also have a new zine out at my table called self Publish Be Free, which is like just a guide to making zines that I'm stoked about. Um, yeah, I don't know what I'm working on. I'll figure that out after. <laughs> <laughs> Amazing, well thank you so much everyone. This has been such a pleasure. Thank you, thank you so much. Thank you for coming. I hope that this was fun for you. Uh, yeah, and we will see you on the show floor. Thanks.